Welcome to DrupalCon. Um, this session is JavaScript and accessibility. Don't blame Everett Zufelt. Uh, did to be presented here again as well. In the presentation, I'm blind. I'm going to have this earbud in my ear uh, during the presentation just so that I can listen to my notes. One of my colleagues, Lee, in the front row here is driving the slides, and she'll try to keep up with me as I'm going. <laughs> So thanks once again, everybody, for coming. Uh, before we jump into the session, I want to really just start by saying, uh, really, this session revolves around a, a clear thesis. And like any thesis, uh, I'm certain, any good thesis, I'm certain that there are people in this community and perhaps even in the room that might disagree or disagree strongly with the thesis. And that's important because it's only through sharing ideas and agreeing and disagreeing and combating back and forth around those points that we learn and that we grow as a community. So before I dig into the details, I'll kind of do the spoiler alert. Here's the thesis that I'm here to share. JavaScript is not to blame for accessibility. There might be good reasons not to use JavaScript in your application. There might be good reasons to use JavaScript and to build using progressive enhancement. Accessibility for persons with disabilities who use modern technologies is not one of those good reasons. So if in your mind today, if you've come to this session and you're asking, am I allowed to use JavaScript? Doesn't JavaScript create problems for accessibility? My thesis is the answer is no. So who am I? My name's Everett Zufelt. I'm the director of technology at MyPlanet. I've been working at MyPlanet for just about six years now. I started speaking at DrupalCon in San Francisco in 2010. I gave a quick five-minute lightning talk on accessibility during the core, uh, the core track, which I think at that time was one day in advance of DrupalCon. It wasn't a track like it is now running through the entire conference. I was the accessibility maintainer for Drupal 7. I've participated in the HTML working group at the W3C. Uh, and right now what I'm doing at MyPlanet is I'm supporting a growing team of technologists who use Drupal and React and other open source technologies in order to uh, build cool solutions for our customers. Some of the things we're going to cover today, I want to go over this in advance so that you can decide if you're in the right session. Imagine if, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on myself. Uh, and and explain some of the barriers that I personally have run into with accessibility on the web. We're going to talk about a few myths about accessibility. We're going to talk about the truth about accessibility. We're going to talk about affordances, and for any designers in the room, that term probably resonates, but for people who are maybe less familiar with interface design, we'll do a bit of a refresher around what an affordance is and why affordances are important. We'll talk about JavaScript and its role on the web, We'll talk about how browsers take information from HTML and the DOM and map that into something that assistive technologies can make use of. We're going to talk about the div problem and how we fix it. We're going to talk about some complexities uh, you know, outside of maybe some more, uh, I'll use the word monolithic, but outside of uh, applications that we might be familiar with where each page of content is a single request and response from the server. We'll talk about things that are more application-like uh, or single-page apps and where some additional uh, complexities around accessibility emerge. We'll talk about some complex user interface components, things that don't exist in the HTML5 specification so that we need to go out of our way to write even more JavaScript in order to make those items accessible. And we'll talk about what we can all be doing next in order to progress accessibility on the web. So a little bit of a background on me. Uh, I was born with a degenerative eye disease. I was born with glaucoma, but it's called congenital glaucoma. Most people, the vast majority of people who have glaucoma, uh, get glaucoma later on in life, either as complication from heart disease or diabetes. I was born with glaucoma. Uh, it's a progressive eye disease. There's not really, you can slow it down, but there's not a lot you can do about it. So from a young age, I knew that it was highly likely that at some point during my adult life, I would lose my sight. I learned web development in the late 90s, so let's talk like 96, 97, 98. 
uh, where you were writing you know, one page for Netscape, one page for Internet Explorer, and then sometimes two different pages for two different versions of Netscape, two different pages for two different versions of Internet Explorer. It's around 2004 that I completely lost my remaining vision. Uh, and I'd say it's probably been, I was trying to answer this question for myself earlier today, it's probably been about 15 years that I've been working with assistive technology. Like, situations that have happened to me. You referred to a popular social media platform and it was impossible to register. Just something about that registration form you weren't able to register. Imagine a popular online shopping site. You know, you're 30, 40 minutes in. It's completely impossible to check out of the store. Imagine if you log into an application for your job. Maybe it's an HR application and you your, your colleagues are telling you, yeah, just go push the request time off button or whatever other task you're trying to complete and those buttons don't exist for you in the application. Imagine if you're trying to book a hotel room or a flight and you just, no matter what you do, cannot enter the check-in date or the departure date that you're, that you're trying to use. Imagine if you're working with a software delivery team, like I assume many of us do, and you want to contribute to planning with the team, but the, but the task management tool your team uses makes it impossible for you to move items around the board, group them into sprints, or prioritize them with your group. So these are all experiences that I've had, uh, whether in my personal life or in my working life, barriers that I've run into because of my disability and because of the assistive technology I use, but moreover because what I will assume to be very well-intentioned web developers didn't have enough understanding of how accessibility works on the web to be able to make those interfaces accessible. Abilities don't use my web application. Years ago, I was uh, doing a bit of an introduction to accessibility at Ryerson College in Toronto, and they asked, uh, one, of the one of the students said, well, I'm building, a, I'm building an online store that sells art, so clearly, that doesn't need to be accessibility to people who are accessible to people who are blind. Screen reader users, script. So now the screen readers, obviously they can't use JavaScript. Accessibility, that's only a half myth. <laughs> I'll let you figure out for yourself which part's the myth. Uh, I'll go, I'll make a bold statement here that if, if the if the goal of being a greatest possible audience of users, then it's absolutely an important goal. You know, we've never tested it. Second to last one is daily in the United States. Nobody in my industry has been taken to court. And over the last couple of years, there's been a DA against retailers and other businesses across America, uh, universities, retail business, grocery stores, athletics companies, uh, absolutely, unless you're in a very niche industry, somebody in your business has been taken to court. And the last myth, JavaScript is not accessible, uh, and quite clearly it is. Got a bit of a quote up there, and if you, I'm not sure if you can see, but if you take a look there, this quote's from WCAG 1.0, we're, we're on 2.1 now, and 20 years ago, the recommendation was make sure that the pages work when scripts, applets, everybody remember applets, uh, and other programmatic objects are turned off because those poor folks with disabilities can't use those types of tools, and they, they couldn't. This wasn't wrong. This wasn't a wrong recommendation and it wasn't a wrong approach. But this was 20 years ago. I could still see uh, when this was a recommendation. I was just barely learning how CSS and HTML all worked together back in the late 90s to build websites. Uh, this is not confusion has come from because many, many years that, and we all did this for, for the purposes of accessibility. Some truths about accessibility. Accessibility is a human right under the United Nations Charter for the Rights of Persons. The world is definitely skewed toward 
ability. You're not going to interfere with your work. Make your easy thing to start. That's absolutely some specific domain knowledge. That's why I'm here sharing with you today. Doing is better is going to make your application easy. Uh, a poll from about a year ago, less than seven about JavaScript accessibility. So you're in good company with 75% of your peers. So why, are, why did I want to talk about affordances here when we're talking about JavaScript? So, you know, although JavaScript can be used server-side using solutions like Node, the, the aspect or the usage of JavaScript that has on accessibility by far scripts used in the browser, the user experience, and to add interactivity where interactivity doesn't exist natively in HTML. And when we're talking about interactivity and we're talking about user interface design, we, ha we just, ne by necessity, we're talking about with the term, the ability for us, typically on the web, it's the purpose of an object when we don't have access to that object. I can't touch it, I can't feel it, I can't. Visual language we use and patterns so that you can believe the drop down menu as it has to do with explicit affordances. These are easy evident that that's interactive and that if you click it, something will happen. You don't know what's going to happen, but you know something's going to happen when you click on that link. Pattern is on a website with a, an arrow pointing downward or perhaps an arrow. See that, and if that arrow is close enough to the word or the phrase, you infer that there's some amount of interactivity that when you click on that word or phrase, it's going to expand. Hidden affordances, these ones become a little bit more tricky. Hidden affordances aren't revealed until somebody has done something. This might be the little question mark beside a form field element. And you've learned over the years of interacting on the web that if you hover over top of or click on that little question mark, some more information is going to appear. Negative affordance, the submit button, and it's, there's a level of opacity applied to it. It looks, like it's, it looks like it's been disabled. Well, that's an affordance as well. And most of these affordances and most of the behaviors that we're talking here, uh, perhaps with the exception of that last one, but even, but even with the last one, most of these affordances, the behavior behind them is JavaScript. So we're using CSS, yes to visually represent the affordance, but we're using general interactivity. Quite simply, it allows you to create dynamic content on the web. It allows us to do more than present a document. It allows us to engage our users through a level of interest than clicking on a link and loading the next page of content. Too basic for some of browsers, and the DOM is not HTML. Even with things, HTML and DOM do very, very different things. Files a markup language. It was able to embed images. What it is is a text file. It's people and can be rendered in a browser. It generates once. More importantly, nowadays, use DOM is almost underlying or a, a very minimally underlying source document that loads JavaScript. The JavaScript creates all of the DOM elements, whether you're using React or Ember or Angular or just using jQuery straight up on its own. All of the items, all the elements in the DOM are created by JavaScript, and some of that content is embedded in the JavaScript. Sometimes that content is retrieved through a, through a callback to a web server. In the last couple of years, we've Drupal but there might actually be in your application very minimal HTML. There might be only enough HTML to load the JavaScript on the page that, that works as the basis of that single page application. Is a source document that was HTML into a document object model, model and turns it into or exposes it as an accessibility API.
And it's that API that, and it's different on every API that is to both to interact with a lot of interactive elements are really a sea of divs and spans. So obviously when I I'm not hearing divs and spans, but I'm really getting no and perhaps a common complex from scratch rather than just using a plugin. You know how many considerations need to go building a calendar on the web, and all I hear is one, six, seven. There's nothing that indicates to me that the, there's nothing that indicates month of the year or what year I'm. It's just this sea of numbers on the page. Now, you learn about the year, you learn about the year, but technology doesn't tell us that it's a link or a I've learned that that's probably a button. That's probably who wrapped to the word save in a div or a span, and they added a click hand to that div or span. Yes, indeed, if I simulate a click with my virtual, it will save what it is I'm working on. Buttons, I'm going to go be bold here and say you have an excuse for buttons. They're into H calendars. For things drop we've been using in popular culture, and most common components to build in Excel. You don't really have designers, you don't really have a lot of guidance on how to do it properly. In a div and you put a click and button element, but a calendar stands for you to build and if you and so that's why a few years specifications. And I three C got together and said that maybe grid being used on the way, but that don't exist in the HTML together, and they, they define language around well, with role if that you can now add DOM will troll equal to a in the accessible and with accessible with a few under of having these area documents. Aria is now part of the H tiers didn't make do the H with H5, which is not a document anymore. Web applications, we're using the API is being created by browser style things and to add behavior applications. Work around this. One, I type in all my search results page because my screen reader. One of the I hear on. So now as a, it's on that page, is there here from my screen textual affordance in the same way they do other customers using a visual? The next departure result sorted by price lowest. It's an indicator to me that I the concept of sometimes they're able to open an action home. On Thursday, when I get onto that experience, and indicates to you something's changing on your face, it's traveled or otherwise. Kind of leave the assistive technology, especially alert. You don't really know what's happening. Do I have to go? Literally, I have no idea. Next thing I hear on the Expedia site after I for nonstop reads, filtering, and a moment later it says, filtered. I think the Expedia has done an excellent job at what is uh, actually a fair one level to communicate visual and filtering on data and the readiness of and by just simple statements about what's happening, what people can see happening in the browser, a frustrating or experience for me, and turn that is actually quite delightful. Uh, do these things on Expedia on your own. I have. Doing live demos of the 
conferences. The reality types of rooms are not really amenable to having somebody who has never heard, who has only seldom listened to, uh, hear, it, hear it talking echoey room. You just, you just don't. But if you were to go and check that, filter those results, and then if you open the bottom of the DOM, you last message that would be sitting there as text, text at the bottom of the DOM. And how that works is using something regions. So we talked about ARIA is accessible. We talked about the fact that there's different. So for a lot of these more components that we want to be adding to our web page, that ARIA create a broad in ARIA, it's not really a component per se. This concept of a live region. Region is really simple. That you mark up using, using the ARIA states and and when new DOM nodes are added from assistive technology know to read that they they monitor it in the DOM and they announce now there's some politeness set and typically they range from kind of if this is very very important if you want happening you can set it on the more term if it's less than news ticker that's scrolling uh, though I would encourage ticker automatically on a web page. If it's something less important, go on the more polite end of the spectrum. And that all happens whether or not the screen is being read in order to components we've, I've talked about a little bit here. Again, I'm not uh, over the speaker system because I don't get anything out of it, but I'd be happy a couple of people who want to learn more afterward a private demo uh, later on during the One of the things that I will uh, have demoed here I've said, and I know it's probably hard to believe, for the 15 to 20 years we use on the web, we still don't really have a great web websites, and this is where I get to create a little bit of conflict because on Nashville website, at the site before it, and I would guess the for that has a fairly down menu, and so my colleague who's driving demonstrate this menu is not terrible. At least tab through menu items and access them with a key. Who couldn't use a pointing device? Only able to navigate through web pages. You can at least navigate through those top level on one of them and go to the page. But what you'll see there, and if you do it on your own in your brain, what you should be able to see is that new items receives focus. New items beneath it do expand. But it's impossible to get. So if you want, well, which is underneath program, a way to get to the schedule. Go down, there's no list of submenu items, there's no way to get there. And almost every website variation of this sort of drop down menu more complex with multiple columns of drop advertising content on the right hand side. It, it, it actually isn't the type of thing to make accessible.
Tomorrow afternoon, my colleague Laura and I are going to do accessibility testing, and we'll talk about how this pattern actually is so complex, not readily tested by four. But suffice it to say, even on the DrupalCon website, and together the website, but it's quite right. In reader, how would I use that menu? I would. I did yesterday because I was looking up this guy. I'd find the the link for program. And use a keyboard command on my keyboard. The mouse to where my. And I've actually moved the mouse over, which expands the drop down list. Continue pressing the down arrow in my keyboard until I want. Screen reader user knows how to do all complex set of interactions submenu item. We won't demo this one, but mass.gov I think I think the mass.gov team of research into what makes and on their site you are able so if you were to again try this afterward able to move across the top level items you can choose whether or not you want of submenus or whether or not you're moving across the top of the top level a pattern for making this successful complex user interface component very last accessibility enhancements we had many years ago is autocomplete. Seven and Drupal eight, the autocomplete field is. Um, if you start typing in a destination like Nash, SH, user, so there's going to be a visual affordance, some indication that there's a number of locations search between. User, you have no idea that the pop up a lot. I use hotels.com a lot. There's a few letters of a city name, and then I'll probably, there'll probably be an autocomplete. On the other hand, it does, once again, I said, I said with that using those live reads, the data, and I think Expedia does a terrific lead as well. So with ex start to type in NASH for now, what I'd hear read in my screen reader. 10 suggestions, convenience. Use the arrow list. So really the exact same information, perhaps even just looking at the screen, I'm being told, I'm being told how to interact. I'm even being told that there's people, and you'd have to count the list to find out that there's more information than somebody who can see. So I think that Expedia has done The last one that I'd like to um, is calendar. I've talked about hard to do. It's hard to do where they can type in a date, though. And using a lot of American websites, I know a, a feel. Uh, uh, I I just do it both ways and hope for that one of them. On Aeroplan, uh, is loyalty program for the time being. And up until a couple of months ago, impossible. And I, that's. Okay. I've been working with the web a long time. I can even open up the dev tool to make the page more accessible to my to remediate my own accessibility until a couple of months ago it was easy to type a date into the flight the date field so if you were to try to type the date manually you could search top to bottom of the calendar, it was impossible. 
that slightly, but what I'd like to call for an example. So whether it's Hilton or Sweets or any of the Hilton brands, if you search there, when you interact with the as a, with a screen reader, when you eight field, not only can you yourself if you know the right format out loud. And I think that too much information, but I mean, let's err on the down arrow will move you into the cabinet where you can use the arrow keys to select enter key to make your selection escape to leave the date picker want to enter the date manually and I using a screen not only does it date through the calendar and field but it gives me that there is tells me how to move around the calendar, tells me how to select a date dismiss the calendar I don't like using the calendar as an excellent exa example of an accessible I normally ask um, Thursday afternoon if you'd like to come up that we can chat and I can give you a want me to take a look at one of the apps I can take a look at pages and let things look. A really big take home is that Java is not to blame. For example from Hilton, possible without Java. When I click on the chat box to filter my connections, and media tells me that it's applying the filter, and then a few moments later, the filter has been applied, that's not JavaScript. Take those down menus on mass.gov, keyboard only, and so you can navigate through the service of the government. You can't properly without Jack is not to blame. So working together. This is a so if we think about everything you think, oh I've got this blog filters that's when the fill this date component on that's not a I just grabbed the thing I found on what you're doing is better than easy and you accessible than it was yesterday. And using the live region, but with extension, does sound like a lot. So, when the spec frameworks community and accessibility, accessibility, I know that my colleague said that there's a group of people sometimes some great source around how to build. There's lots of people out there who've gone before you, accessible app gone before 